can you even call it a Jeep if it don't got four wheel drive? The answer is no. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my comprehensive guide on how to fix a two wheel drive Cherokee. From 1984 to 2001, every single Jeep Cherokee ever made per factory specifications, if nothing else, came standard with four-wheel drive. To get a two-wheel drive one, they had to be specially requested, generally for the people down south who never have a practical purpose for it. Two-wheel drive XJs were cheaper to produce, cheaper to buy, cheaper to insure, better on gas, and still share the same suspension setup as the four-wheel drive ones through use of a free-rolling beam axle in the front, introduced in mid-model year 1985. The Comanches were the same, so this video will generally apply to every 1987 plus XJ and MJ that is two-wheel drive. I have a ton to get through and there are a lot of model year cutoffs for a lot of the parts you need, so I have links to each more detailed component in the description that will take you to some of my other videos where you can learn all about what doesn't make sense right now. The 4x4 swap is a major undertaking, definitely not something you can do in a day, and we're going to be tearing the Jeep down to its core, so if you're new to Cherokees and looking to buy a two wheel drive one in hopes of a quick and easy conversion, I'd keep an eye out for one that's already four wheel drive. However, if you found and have a two-wheel drive that was just too good of a deal to pass up, I totally understand because that's exactly the situation I'm in here. The easy and arguably only way to source parts is directly from a donor Cherokee. Many of the more trivial things like the lever mechanism haven't ever been produced on the aftermarket, so almost every component I used came from the reclaimer. May its legacy live on. First and foremost, you need a different transmission, whether that be an AX15 or AW4, the two-wheel drive transmissions are exactly the same internally, but have an extended tail shaft instead of a transfer case mounting flange. The tail shaft cannot be removed, it's part of the entire casing, and because of that, you're going to need at least the case and output shaft of a four-wheel drive transmission of whatever your XJ has. If you don't know what transmission you have, watch my Transmissions Basics video where I cover every single one available in the Cherokees. Generally, you're going to need one from the same year range that yours is, so here's your interchange years for each 4 liter equipped transmission. In my case, I have a 2001 Cherokee with the NV3550. Now, finding a four-wheel drive XJ NV3550 is going to be almost impossible, as I hear only about 1% of the 2000 plus models were manuals, so I found this transmission in a 2000 Wrangler TJ. I also want to point out that you can only use YJ, TJ, or KJ transmissions if your XJ has a manual, as the other Jeep models of the era used completely different automatics. If you do use a Wrangler or Liberty transmission, you'll need to clock the transfer case. The XJs angle the transfer case 12 degrees farther to the left to prevent it from hitting the floor pan. So the holes on the transmission mating flange need to be re-drilled exactly 12 degrees to the left. Thankfully, my good pal Bryant Sapp is 3D printing these fancy things. I don't have time to say the name, but find his Instagram in the description where you can buy one yourself and re-clock the transfer case exactly where it needs to be. I'll demonstrate how this works later on, and note you don't need this if you're using an XJ transmission. So for now, moving on to our next ingredient, a transfer case. Who would have thought, right? If you don't know which transfer case you're going to use, watch my video all about the XJ transfer cases. I am going with an NP231, as I figure most people will, and this one actually came from a Liberty. I wouldn't necessarily recommend using a Liberty NP231 because they do need to be pretty thoroughly reconstructed to work in an XJ, but in my specific case, I needed one with a long input shaft, which means I was limited to 2000 to 2004 Jeep Wrangler TJs that had the 4 liter and were manual. You'll find Wrangler parts are ridiculously expensive for no reason, but I found what I thought was a good deal on eBay from Dead Jeep, a 231 allegedly removed from the Wrangler I needed. I ordered it, and not only was shipping going to take over a month, but it ended up getting here a week after their estimated arrival date. It was missing all the mounting studs, had nothing covering the speedometer hole, a failed indicator switch, and had been spray painted silver to make it look new and shiny. Nice. Hearing from people out there who'd had bad experiences with Dead Jeep, Bryant being one of them, I didn't exactly have the utmost faith and certainty in them, and that's where the Liberty transfer case idea came from. Because Liberties are everywhere in junkyards, and their parts are dirt cheap. 
I will delve into what I did to make it work later in the video, but for now let's assume you are using XJ parts, as I would be if I had literally any other transmission. The thing to be concerned about is input shaft length, that I cover in detail in the transfer case video, and spline count, which for the Renix era there's a lot of conflicting information about, so here's your interchange years for the NP231. So you need to match the year range of the transfer case to the year range of your four-wheel drive transmission, which needs to be matched to the year range of your Jeep. There's a million different ways you could make these tons of combinations work, and even more if you build the transfer case to work in your application. You can use pretty much any transfer case in any year if you just swap out whatever components you need to. The NP231 is a very adaptable transfer case with these three main arrows to stick to. It's a matter of changing what your specific Jeep needs. Purely hypothetically, if I had a 1993 automatic Cherokee, I'd need a four-wheel drive AW4 from a 91 to 93 XJ specifically, and a 23 spline medium length input shaft NP231 from a 92 to 95 XJ or ZJ. I could adapt a YJ transfer case all the same by changing the input shaft on it to match, and very quickly we can see why it's most recommended to just source everything from the same donor vehicle. Anywhere on this sheet you see XJ, you can also pretend it says MJ in that spot, because aside from the rear drive shaft, the Comanches are entirely identical when it comes to the four-wheel drive swap. So you can use an XJ donor to four-wheel drive swap an MJ, you'll just have to source the rear drive shaft separately. On that note, the two-wheel drive models used a really long rear drive shaft, so you need a four-wheel drive drive shaft for both the front and rear. These are again easiest to find off a donor vehicle, so if you have a Jeep you're taking parts off of, there are a few things you need to be aware of. The drive shafts vary in length with automatic or manual transmissions, so if you have an automatic, you're going to need automatic drive shafts. The front shaft uses a double carden joint and the rear shaft is a typical single carden. Although I removed both of these from my old Jeep, I did buy them both off Rock Auto as Dorman still makes drive shafts brand new for the XJ if you just can't find any in a junkyard. Another thing to watch out for on the rear shaft is the type of slip yoke it uses. Our older transfer cases from 1987 to 1995 used an internal slip yoke for their output shaft, where the newer transfer cases 1996 plus have an external slip yoke, so the yoke itself included with the drive shaft will be different depending on this. You can easily use a 95 prior shaft in a 96 and later Jeep and vice versa by changing out the slip yoke or by using a different type of transfer case, etc, etc. It really does get very complicated very quickly and there's a ton of random interchangeability trivia that I can't cover here. So we're going to stop talking about sticks of metal and move on to a beam of metal instead. The Dana 30 was the only front axle in the factory four-wheel drive Cherokee, so assuming you're not going on one tons or some crazy shit, a Dana 30 from your surrounding year will simply bolt right in place of the two-wheel drive beam axle. I again have a separate video delving into detail on the Dana 30 and its variants. The two main things you need to be concerned about though are the gear ratio and the pinion level. You need to match the front axle's gear ratio to your rear axle. Do not, under any circumstances, drive with two different gear ratios in the axles, unless it's just a temporary thing and you don't have a front drive shaft. This Jeep had 307 gears in the back, and I had a 355 axle for the front, so I swapped both of these axles over from the Reclaimer, rest in peace, and as you can see, I already have the Dana 30 installed. I did that almost a year ago, it's just kind of been in here free-spinning all that time. I'm not going to show how to swap the front axle in this video because there's already a ton of other videos documenting that. It's the exact same process in the ZJs, WJs, and TJs, so there's a link to a good one in the description. The Dana 30 in the 1984 through 99 Cherokee used a high pinion, and the Dana 30 in the 2000 Plus Cherokee used a low pinion. You can use a low pinion axle in any year, and a high pinion axle in any year except 2000 Plus, unless you're either on a lift or modify the exhaust. Lastly about the Dana 30 is if you find one from before 1992, they'll sometimes have a center axle disconnect system in them, which I wouldn't recommend trying to actually set up in a Jeep that doesn't have four-wheel drive. I mean, you have to deal with running vacuum lines to the transfer case and the engine and all sorts of nonsense, so it's best to just bypass these. Maybe if I got off my ass and made a video on how to do that, I could link it here, but until then, you're on your own, pal. You're going to need the four-wheel drive shift linkage, as I always say. The stock linkage is not worth the time it takes to even talk about it. I have an ASI linkage in every Jeep I own. This one part will work with any combination of transmission and transfer case, so there's that taken care of. 
Along with the linkage, you'll of course need the lever mechanism and a matching shift gate for whatever transfer case you're using. The levers should all be the same functionality-wise, but aesthetically they changed from having this red stripe after 1995, where they're instead just a plain black. As a final touch, you'll want the trim bezel. Although not functional in any sense, it does replace the two-wheel drive's coin tray on the center console. After all these years, finally, we have them all. Lastly, and entirely optionally, the connector and some extra wire for the four-wheel drive indicator light on the dashboard, called the transfer case switch. All this does is light up the indicators to tell you what mode of four-wheel drive you're in. You do not need this for the four-wheel drive to work, it's just an indicator, but I'm shooting for factory functionality, so we'll do a little bit of wiring. Talking about wiring, even if you don't care about the four-wheel drive switch, we do have to modify the existing transmission harness just a little bit. You don't need the entire drivetrain harness off a donor vehicle because the only thing that isn't going to work is the speedometer gear. On the two-wheel drive models, the speedometer sensor is mounted on the transmission's tail shaft, and on the four-wheel drive models, it's instead on the transfer case. Looking at this diagram, we can see the CPS, reverse light switch, and downstream O2 sensor, which all share the same wiring harness, are all located in the exact same spot on either driveline but the speedometer sensor will need its wiring extended by just about a foot. On the AW4, I've heard rumors that the output shaft speed sensor is located in a different spot on the two-wheel drive ones, but I could never find any definitive evidence or proof of it. So if you have an automatic, you might need to mess with that connector's wiring a little bit. I don't know for sure. But to summarize the wiring, we need to extend the three wires for the speedometer, add one new wire for the dashboard light, a second for a body ground, and the connector for the switch itself. I just want to emphasize that you do not need any sort of harness or a different ECU or anything. The Renix Jeeps ought to be a little different though. You instead might need a longer speedometer cable, and their dashboard light functions off the vacuum shared with the cat axle, so that'll require a little more digging. I couldn't really find any information on it. And before I forget, you'll need a vent hose for the transfer case and front axle. They have a nub on the top of them, and that's for a vent line to be routed up somewhere high, like at the back of the engine bay, to avoid water getting inside these two very important drivetrain components. A quick rundown of what all this swap entails. Remove the front beam axle and install a Dana 30, ideally replacing all the worn out suspension stuff in that process. Remove the two-wheel drive transmission, and with that, install the four-wheel drive lever, extend the speedometer wires or cable, add your vent hose, and if you have a manual, may as well replace the clutch components too. Then install the four-wheel drive transmission and transfer case, top it off with the drive shafts, and most importantly, go out and see what new capabilities you've unlocked by having a driven front axle. So with the Jeep up on jack stands and our Dana 30 installed, let's get to work on this transmission. First thing I'm going to do is tackle the interior. With the center console already removed from that rear disc brake swap you're coincidentally also working on at the same time, I'll remove the lower shift boot to get access to the four bolts that hold the NV3550 shift lever onto the casing. I very much understand that literally nobody has an NV3550 in a Cherokee, so again, I have a separate video for removing the AW4, and the AX15 is pretty much identical to this one. Make sure the transmission is in neutral before you fully unbolt this thing. With a paper towel shoved in here, let's disconnect the battery because we gotta remove the starter. The 99 Plus starter uses a half inch nut holding the main feed wire on and a connector for the ground. And then the upper bolt is 15 millimeter and the lower bolt is 9 16 with that out of the way, I'll next drain the fluid from the transmission. The NV3550 uses a 17mm Allen bolt. Ooh, okay. I've done worse. Well, it doesn't look too bad, all things considered. Let's look at the drain plug magnet. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> yep, that's an NV3550, all right. Holy shit. Here's it's all cleaned up. That thing was completely packed full of metal. I don't think it could even pick up anymore. Put that drain plug back in so as not to lose it, and then I'll tackle the drive shaft. Four 8mm bolts secure it to the pinion at the rear axle.
pry it out of there, and on the two-wheel drive transmissions, the yoke on the drive shaft is actually lubricated by transmission fluid, meaning it also acts as a seal. Now, I figured by draining the fluid first, I wouldn't have to deal with this. Oh my god. Well, that was a lot more of a mess than I thought it'd be, Jesus. The speedometer, reverse light switch, bang 2 downstream O2 sensor, and the crankshaft position sensor can all be unplugged. Then the clutch slave cylinder. Half inch deep socket. be why my clutch wasn't doing so well. And on the front side of the bell housing, we have three very sneaky half-inch bolts that probably oh need an archaeological expedition to find under all that grease. But you'll never get the transmission out if you don't remove the one on each top side, and the one right at the bottom. There it is. I got that son of a bitch from up here. While in the area, bring an 18mm socket and wrench with you because the two lower corners of the bell housing are held with these. Yep. Just like the automatics. You will also have to detach the muffler from the catalytic converter. The rear section of the exhaust is held to the body, and the front is obviously attached to the engine. So when we tilt the engine down to remove the transmission, there's a chance you could break some part of the exhaust. Alternatively, you could delete the tailpipe and be a certified Florida man too. The transmission mount mounts to the cross member with four 13mm nuts. A deep socket will reach in each hole, and I broke one, but that's fine because I don't care. Mm. Yeah, I was hoping I could avoid that. Dude, we are steaming along. With the transmission jack, take the weight of the transmission off the cross member so we can get that out of the way. Two bolts and two nuts hold it to the frame, and I would like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that no matter how non-rusty your Jeep is, these suckers really like to break off. Oh, no. Come on, I thought I had movement out of that. So a reminder of the past, a more patient Wayman warns you now. Soak these good with peanut butter many times for many days before you start this project. And with careful persuasion, as I discussed in the AW4 removal video a long time ago, I did successfully remove the other side's bolt, and again, without heat. Anyway, with the cross member out of here, I lowered the transmission onto the support of a jack stand because the transmission jack was in the way of the mount adapter, which needs to come off before the whole thing does. With that removed, put the transmission jack back in place and importantly position another jack under the oil pan with a block of wood to keep the engine held in place after we have the transmission out. With it tilted downwards, find these two E12 Torx bits on the top. Reached with every extension I have, I managed to get them out with a cheater bar. Lastly, on either side of the bell housing are 16 millimeter bolts, so with those removed, the whole transmission is next. That's an awfully lot of oil in there. Sometimes people wonder which transmission is really better, the AX15 or NV3550. It really is a matter of preference, but from a technical and design standpoint, the AX15 is factually a better transmission. So one might wonder why I went through such effort to keep an NV in this thing instead of swapping in an AX15. 
Who's the good input champ? Not you. I think a debate or a showdown between the two is worthy of its own video. I do certainly like the AX15, but I'm staying with the NV3550 if only for novelty's sake. The 2000 plus Cherokees are impossible to find with a factory manual, and they hold a special place to me because of that. The four wheel drive unit I had came from a guy who destroyed it. It doesn't have second gear, and after installing a very well used transmission in my Jeep before, I've learned my lesson. This time, it's getting rebuilt before it goes in. So I tried a highly recommended transmission shop in Ocala, Florida, but they denied me because they only rebuild automatics. I was directed to Brooksville Transmission, they said they could do it, but after I delivered it there, they very quickly realized nobody makes parts for the NV3550 anymore, and therefore a rebuild was not possible. They didn't even want to touch the thing. They called All Star Transmission in Tampa, apparently this big shot transmission shop that has contacts all over the country, and this guy with a hundred years of experience told me that not only does nobody make parts for them, but the parts that do exist for them are of a suboptimal quality, and I'll likely have to bring it back in for a rebuild in a few thousand miles anyway because of that. He told me to swap in an AX15 because that's what everyone does in this situation. The guy I got this NV3550 from did too, so it seemed like all was lost and that was my only option. But Facebook Marketplace, you never fail. A single man operates a small business here in Florida and his entire devotion is fixing transfer cases and manual Jeep transmissions specifically, including our ever so elusive NV3550. I messaged this guy with a plan. I know new parts don't exist for these transmissions anymore, but... What if you could take the used but still good internals out of my two-wheel drive NV and put them inside the four-wheel drive casing? Using the best of the two together, we could create the greatest new venture transmission there ever was. Roger is an absolute beast. He knows literally everything about these transmissions and is the only reason you're watching this video right now. Before I began tearing my Jeep down, I had brought him my four-wheel drive NV3550 preemptively, and by smell alone, he could tell the previous owner had run 90 weight gear oil in it, not the required Synchromax fluid, and that had destroyed the synchronizers, which led to ground down teeth on the second gear. This is why people hate the NV3550, because they don't use the right gear oil, and when the transmission gets destroyed because of that, it's somehow Chrysler's fault. Regardless, on the two-wheel drive transmission, I removed the clutch fork and the bell housing just to make the teardown go a little nicer for him. I need to keep my reverse switch and speedometer gear, and then for once on the channel, I actually put the MJ to work and loaded up the transmission and my Liberty transfer case. The KJ and V231s are pretty much the same as the XJ and TJ ones, but a few things do need to be changed. Firstly, the KJs do not use a speedometer gear. They instead use ABS wheel speed sensors for their speedometer reading. Therefore, their transfer case output shafts don't have a hole for the speed sensor, so that rear case section needs to be swapped out. Secondly, the output shaft has a wider diameter. The XJ's drive shaft yoke doesn't fit on the KJ's output shaft, so it needs to be changed too. On the front drive shaft, the Liberty uses a CV joint, and the XJ has a double cardan, so that also needs to be changed. And of course, the indicator switch works a bit differently on the KJ, and related, the pivot arm inside the transfer case that engages said indicator switch is also a bit different. They work inverted, so if you hook up a stock KJ case to the XJ's indicator circuit, the part-time light will be on when you're in two-wheel drive and off when you're in four-wheel drive, so that's a no. You also have to change the pivot arm for the shift linkage, but since I'm using an ASI linkage, it replaces that anyway. Roger was willing and able to swap this all out, so while he's busy building my transmission and transfer case, there's a few things we need to do before it all goes back in. With no transmission in the Jeep, there's no better time to replace the clutch disc and all its related stuff, so six half-inch bolts hold the pressure plate to the flywheel. What do we have here? For the flywheel itself, I always found it easiest to just use an impact gun because the bolts are tighter than lug nuts and there isn't much room for leverage down here. Evidence of overheatage.
Lastly, I popped off the dust cover to get a look at the freeze plugs on the back of the engine. A couple things to look at while we're in here. The pilot bearing feels feels good. There's hardly any grease left in it, but uh, it feels pretty all right. I'm pretty sure my uh, oil pan gasket is leaking back here. Uh, I mean, it could be the rear main seal, of course, too. I did preemptively order some freeze plugs, but these look fine. These de definitely look like they've been replaced before. Now, an easy way to tell is to poke them with a screwdriver. Give them a good firm taps. You want to knock them out, obviously. These rust from the inside out. And with a screwdriver, you poke it decently and it punctures. Firstly, you'll know it's a bad freeze plug because you just made coolant spill everywhere on top of you and under the vehicle. Secondly, they're not supposed to be able to be punctured with screwdrivers. Now, I was afraid because the previous owner ran just plain water in this engine that these would both be fried. Well, there's another one up here on the head too, which also looks like it has been replaced before. So, that's a good sign. I don't think I'm gonna worry about these. From the back, you can easily visually inspect the freeze plugs and all these have clearly been replaced before. You may have noticed earlier on the transmission that bell housing was completely caked and well, so is the entire tunnel cover area. And uh, well, that's definitely some top end oil leaks. We can see the streams of oil that have been there for decades are coming all the way from the valve cover. With everything entirely removed off the back of the engine, it is the best time to replace this thing. Which this, it's still got its zip tie right there. I mean, this thing could be the original one. Now, I don't know if these clutch hydraulic things can even last 270,000 miles, but this one really did seem original, and this Jeep had a really heavy clutch pedal ever since I've owned it. Even though I am replacing everything, I'm confident this component in particular is the cause of the heavy clutch. The hydraulics are always a pain to get out of there. More evidence pointing to this one being original. I had to loosen the brake booster with the four nuts behind the pedal to get the line out from behind it. This thing's literally routed behind everything. Like this is the first line they installed. So up there is your new one and on the bottom is the old one. Now the only thing this one doesn't have is the clutch safety switch. This is your little thing that only allows you to start the car when the when the uh, clutch is pressed in. I'm pretty sure in order to install this, you have to put it on the rod before the rod goes into the master cylinder. And as you can see, the rod is already on the master cylinder. So I think I'm just going to not have a clutch safety switch anymore, which doesn't really bother me because I'm not an idiot and I don't start the car in gear. I mean... The MJ came without one from the factory, so I've never had a problem not having a clutch safety switch. It was tedious and annoying to ride it back down there, but we're not here for clutch hydraulics, we're here for four-wheel drive. Okay, you know, honestly, the first time I put this in, I didn't have a reference, you know, because it was going into an automatic Jeep. Now, I didn't put it behind the master cylinder, I can tell you that, and it worked just fine. It doesn't need to be behind there. So I'm just going to tighten this all back down. Two nuts for the clutch, four nuts for the brake, giving me flashbacks to the manual swap. But with everything tightened down, I made a jumper wire for the CSS, and everything under the dash is done. I took some time to perform some otherwise inaccessible rust preventative measures, <laughs> scraped off a bunch of the old uh -oh. rust starting to form on the underside of the body here, and sprayed it all with a good layer of undercoating and rust reformer. My next objective is to remove this delete plate and install the four-wheel drive lever. Thankfully, because the XJ is the best car ever, there's already a convenient hole here, so you don't need to cut the body at all. Now, this panel is secured to the body with five 8mm bolts. In an ideal world, one would theoretically simply remove these bolts and reuse the same bolts to put the four-wheel drive lever in. But more likely, you'll find the dinky little thread inserts like to break off the body and the bolt won't unscrew, which happened to three of the five on my Jeep. 
Now, what's a problem that can't be fixed with a hammer? I just pounded each one out, which did leave a slightly bigger hole in the body, but that's fine because we'll just use slightly bigger bolts when we put the lever in. Even though I did manage to get two of these bolts out, I decided to knock out the annoying thread inserts anyway, because without them there, it was much easier to wire brush the rust off. Using five quarter inch by 20 bolts with matching locking nuts, I put the lever mechanism in and then sprayed the area with rust reformer. The lever pivot does have an insulator that goes under it. This is mostly for noise and heat dissipation. So with that installed, go ahead and put the left center and right center bolt in as the other three bolts are shared with the shift gate, which we'll install in a minute. In order to hold both the nut and the bolt with a ratchet and wrench, I had a second person sit in the Jeep while I was underneath. The lever includes a spring that wraps around it, which keeps it from accidentally being knocked into neutral while in four-wheel drive. With that spring and the shift gate on the lever, it slides through the pivot, and then a cotter pin goes on the back side. There we go. Then the shift gate is bolted down all the same. All right, and now we just gotta tighten all the nuts down on the back side, which I realize if you have an automatic, you're probably still gonna have the whole lever mechanism here. I don't necessarily know if it's worth taking that out. It might be easier to just have a second person underneath to hold the nut while you tighten the bolt down. But in my case, there's a big ass hole right here, so I can just reach under here and hold both sides myself. There it is, all tightened down, nice and firm. Ha ha ha. With these grade 8 bolts in here, this is probably stronger than it would be from the factory anyhow. How to start your Jeep on fire 101. So I've got positive battery power going directly to this pin on this connector, which I theorize to be the dashboard indicator. So I'm going to go see if the light on the dashboard is on with that hardwired. Oh my god, I don't even need to turn the key on. Look at that! Ha ha ha! Yes! That's a victory, boys. All right, and if I safely disconnect that. <laughs> yes. As for the underside wiring harness, it is a bit interesting. We can't really remove it because it is all part of the engine harness. And I was looking at this and kind of thinking, so we don't need to worry about this. This is for your crankshaft position sensor and your downstream O2 sensor on the California emissions models. So a lot of Jeeps probably won't even have this, this mini separate harness. Uh, this one is for your reverse light switch, which is going to be in the same spot on the four-wheel drive transmission, and your speedometer, which is not going to be in the same spot. Where the speedometer on the side of the two-wheel drive transmission would probably be about right here. On the transfer case, it's probably going to be like back here, and that's kind of stretching the wiring harness a little bit. So... At the very least, we're going to need to extend the connector for the speedometer gear. On pretty much every model other than 2001, you're also going to have a downstream O2 sensor uh, harness that goes all the way back here. And well, since the exhaust is going to be in the same spot, you shouldn't need to worry about that harness either. So I have the remains of a four-wheel drive harness here that I just cut off. We can see this clip on here is going to line up at the same spot of this clip on this harness. The, the wire for the speedometer gear is notably longer on the four-wheel drive harness. And then we've got this little thing, which is just the dashboard indicator for your four-wheel drive switch. So I'm going to need to extend the connector for the speedometer gear and add a new wire that runs along the entire harness all the way up to that connector in the back corner of the engine bay for the dashboard light. But that's all the wiring we have to do. The transmission harness connector on this side, the bottom side, towards the transmission, does not have a pin in it. That would be this top corner one up here for the dashboard light. The other side of that same connector does have a pin in it in that top right slot once again. And the wire coming out of it is uh, black with a red stripe. And that's the part-time light. Now, I don't want to take apart this entire huge-ass connector just to put a single pin in it. I'm going to cut the wire right here and just splice it going from here all the way down to the to the switch on the transfer case. And again, you don't need the dashboard light. All it is is a dashboard light. You do not need to do any of that for factory four-wheel drive functionality. Just tape this piece of wire up to the connector where I'm going to splice it on. 
and kind of vaguely ran it down here and I can reach the parking brake cable which I feel like is going to be plenty long enough to reach the transfer case switch. So I cut the black red wire which is the part-time light. The full-time light for your NP242s is a black with a white stripe but anyway strip the end off it and then a heat shrink crimp connector goes on that. Dude, there's literally not even any wind. The four-wheel drive indicator needs a ground. So we have our main signal wire here, but this needs a ground. And I was thinking we could just tap into one of the existing grounds on this harness. And I was looking on the harness, and it doesn't have a ground. Because none of the things on here need one. The crankshaft sensor, the O2 sensor, the reverse light switch, and the speedometer all run on their own enclosed signal circuits that don't connect to a chassis ground. So on your two-wheel drive XJs, this harness is not going to have a ground wire in it. But there's no sense in running an individual ground wire for a single minuscule dashboard light that nobody even cares about. So instead of doing that and finding some, some ground wire on the harness way up in that mess, I was looking around for something that we could use as a direct chassis ground. And wouldn't you know it, right about where the transfer case sits is this bolt. That'll work as a ground. This is where the bracket mounts that holds the connector for the downstream O2 sensors on literally every single other model of your XJ. So I'm going to try that out and see if it works. Okay, I literally have our signal wire just crammed in there for now. So with that hardwired, if I connect this dashboard light should be on. Fuck. I kind of forgot the part where when we don't have it hardwired directly to the battery, the ignition needs to be on. Yes, okay. So when, this circuit only has power when the ignition is on. Oh, synthwave vibes. Okay, we got part time. Which just confirms my little, uh, my plan here is working. This is just temporary setup. So all we gotta do when we have the transfer case in here, is instead of these wires going directly to each other, just bring them to one of each of the two prongs inside the switch itself, and that'll be the switch that activates the part-time light. Simple as that. So left the O2 sensor, crankshaft sensor, and the reverse light switch. Just left that all alone. Here's my extended speedometer and my attached four-wheel drive indicator light. This wire is for the full-time light, but I'm not going full-time, so I'm just going to tape that off. And then it goes to the speedometer gear connector and the transfer case switch connector. And then from there, it just goes to my special body ground. So I'm going to cover that up with some electric waterproof grease that I don't know where it is right now. I'm going to find that. Tape everything up, put some more wire loom around it all. So if you have an automatic Jeep, you're likely going to have a little bulb in here for the PRNDL shifter. And you need a second bulb if you want the uh, four-wheel drive bezel thing to light up. You know, this is just the bulb that plugs into the backside and makes it look pretty at night. The bulb number is 658, but I have no idea where you're going to get this harness from. I don't know, but because my Jeep was a manual two-wheel drive, there theoretically shouldn't be any bulb under here. Um, so I, I grabbed uh, the harness out of my donor four-wheel drive automatic Cherokee. So here's what it looks like if there's just two, you know, one for the transmission, one for the transfer case. In my case, though, I'm only going to need the one. So uh, the connector for it is already here. It's right under the e-brake. You might need to cut the carpet a little bit. But that just plugs right in. And when we put the center console back in, that'll be ready and waiting for us. Pilot bearing puller. Rented this from AutoZone. Here's your part number. I'm gonna put it in the pilot bearing. And then we tighten this down and it spreads the arms out. And they grab onto it. And we thread on a slide hammer. Boom. This is clean in here. This pilot bearing didn't look bad at all. It's just common practice to replace this stuff when you have the transmission out. 
it is also directional. I doubt you'll be able to see it on the video, but one side has a small rubber ring and the other side does not. That rubber ring needs to be outside because it helps prevent clutch dust from getting inside the bearing and destroying it. And a 17 millimeter socket seems to be a perfect fit for it. All right, and when it's nice and flush with the donut around it, that's all there is to it. This flywheel came from the lettuce Jeep. I only used it for, what, 4,000 miles before my old Jeep was T-boned, so it shall continue to be of service yet again after sitting in my closet for a year. The flywheel bolts are torqued in an alternating pattern to 105 foot-pounds. Here I just had someone hold the crank, which isn't necessarily the best way to torque these bolts down, but my motor mounts are fried enough that trying this with a screwdriver wedged in there just twisted the whole engine and ejected the screwdriver, so I definitely need new motor mounts in the near future. The clutch disc is next, followed by the pressure plate. These six bolts are torqued to 37 foot-pounds. And well, with the clutch done, I'm ready to put the transmission in. So I headed out to pick it up and Roger had done what nobody else wanted to. He put my two-wheel drive transmission inside of a four-wheel drive one and had reconstructed a Liberty transfer case to bolt right into an XJ. He does have a small YouTube channel himself, completely booked full of very helpful tips on all sorts of Jeeps, and I'm very grateful he could help me out, because else I'd still be without four-wheel drive. Soon, I said, soon, I'll have one of the very few 2000 plus manual four-wheel drive Cherokees, and all that's left is to install the transmission. But if you remember from earlier, this NV came out of a Wrangler, so using the SAP Industries Jeep Cherokee Multi-Application Center Pivot Output Shaft Mounted 12 Degree Counter Rotation Computer Rendered 3D Printed Universal 6 Stud Transfer Case Clocking Angle Establishment Offset Drill Bit Stabilization Device, I carefully re-drilled the holes, first using a small bit, and then a match size to the existing holes. I repeated that process using the tool for all six holes, and it did take a few tries to get it right, but eventually, after fine-tuning where I had drilled, the transfer case slid right into place. Ain't no way in hell I would have even tried to do that without Bryant's tool, which I've decided to make a little more of a detailed rundown of in a separate video to save time here. The description is probably going to have a whole library worth of information in it on this one. Alright Marty, go ahead. Go put the transmission in the Jeep now. It's only this side though. There you go. Yeah, just scoot it. Scoot it across the poster. There you go. It's kind of just turning. <laughs> Here, I'll help you. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Is that good? Uh, yeah, we're going to have to I'm gonna have to put this under there. At this point, I'm in a bit of a crunch for various uninteresting reasons. The whole project had been delayed a few times, and well, as of this clip here, I have to be at court in literally three days. That doesn't sound too exciting until I tell you this trial is across the country 1,300 miles away from me, and I have under three days to get the Jeep ready to drive that distance. The trial is for the guy that ran a stop sign and destroyed my old Jeep, which was the donor vehicle for most every part in this one. Suffice to say, after having to start over from ground zero, I'm dead set on being present for this guy's sentencing. And it's only so poetic if the very same parts he effectively rid me of carried me all the way back there to serve him justice. But for the manual install, the process is easy enough, literally the reverse of what we did to get it out. For the automatic install, I have another video for that buried in the mess of reference links that is the description. The jack under the engine and the transmission jack under the transmission. And then as you're trying to align your input shaft, you know, once you get that first nub of it seated in the clutch, 
it's a matter of aligning the splines. And now, if you watch Chris Fix's video, he's got a fantastic video, by the way. Uh, he, you know, he recommends painting the spline that you're going to put on the top. And if you align them properly before you even put the transmission in, they'll theoretically just slide right on. I find that doesn't always work because there's not really anything from preventing the transmission from twisting on the transmission jack. Well, at least this cheap ass one from Harbor Freight. So Roger told me a better trick. With the transmission in fourth gear and the transfer case in four low, as you are aligning that input shaft, you can twist the drive shaft yoke to spin the input shaft and the, sl the splines will just slot right in. And it worked perfectly. I got this transmission on here in five minutes. The last time I did this, I was down here for a fucking hour. Okay, we're gonna slide this onto the exhaust hanger, then pivot it up and bolt it onto the transmission. Got a jack supporting the transfer case. And the transmission jack is out of here temporarily. There's thunder in the distance. Literally tomorrow morning I'm leaving. I'm, I'm speed running this shit. As you can see, my speedometer gear wire extension works good. I actually have, you know, maybe five, six inches of extra wire. So it's just kind of tucked on top of the transfer case there. And I have my ground wire from an indicator switch kind of routed a little bit close to the drive shaft yoke here, but I got it zip tied up there. And you know, if the drive shaft does decide to rip it off, it's just the ground wire for the indicator switch. So I don't really care, but, uh, Better to have more wire than not enough. Got the clutch hooked up. I got the four-wheel drive linkage adjusted. Make sure you don't forget the part where you add fluid. The NV3550 takes 2.1 quarts of MS9224 Synchromax fluid. Only place I've ever found that sells it is AutoZone. I also put about half a pint of Lucas oil stabilizer in there because remember this transmission wasn't necessarily rebuilt per se, it was just refreshed with new bearings and seals. My old four-wheel drive parts that had been sitting in the garage for a year were finally back in. The vent hoses, wires, clutch, four-wheel drive linkage, starter, and drive shafts were all installed and connected. Last thing that's left is to finally reassemble the interior. With these four bolts tightened down, you might notice the lower shift boot is missing. You're supposed to put this on before the shift lever, but uh, we kind of forgot about that part. And uh, the, the, you can't get the shift lever off without doing some weird ass ritual with two bolts and washers and nuts and everything. So I'm just gonna pretend the lower shift boot is in there for now and continue. Center console's in. I'm too excited. And finally, I will have a screw mount here because on the two wheel drive delete panel thing, that screw hole has been stripped out in the entire time I've owned this thing. So finally, my center console will be secured. With my bomb ass glow in the dark shift knob and the upper boot installed, plug that little light bulb into this thing, and then this just snaps right into place. And we have a four wheel drive Cherokee. I'm so excited. I gotta hook up the battery. Okay. Ah, yes! Boom! All right, here we go. Oh my God, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I can't believe I, I can't believe I forgot this. What was I thinking? We can't be driving a four-wheel drive Jeep around without the adequate badging to let everyone know it's a four-wheel drive. I'm gonna use 3M double-sided exterior rated tape to adhere this badge right about where the factory one would be. I cut the tape in the outline of the badge with a pocket knife and then just kind of eyeballed it, smacked her on there good, repeated the process for the other side, and now she's ready for the okay. test drive. Now that that critical element has been taken care of. I pray to the heavens there are no weird noises. Come on now, come on. Oh yeah, and I don't have a clutch safety switch anymore. So, I'm just gonna make sure it's in neutral and try to start it without holding the clutch. And it starts. Oh. Okay, clutch definitely works. It's gonna let that fluid circulate in there for a little bit. transfer case 
That is so satisfying to finally have that. Oh my God. The clutch is so much smoother now. Oh, and it grabs immediately. Oh. Dude. That is so nice. <laughs> you might be concerned about that. Those are normal NV3550 noises. It's just because I don't have the lower shift boot in there. It's going to be making a lot of racket. Okay, so whenever it's in gear, there's a lot of vibration. A lot when you're under load, a little bit when you're engine braking, but when it's not in gear, it's perfectly smooth. So I wonder what that's about. I'll put some more fluid in the thing to make it quiet down, hopefully. And uh, my damn disc brake swap e-brake is stuck. What the hell? There is a considerable amount more rolling resistance like in neutral, just kind of coasting with the two-wheel drive transmission, it, it would go a little bit farther than this. Uh, transfer cases do add some drivetrain parasitic loss. Not that much. But it is interesting, like, to have that comparison in my mind, like, the two next to each other like that. Heat is just billowing up through here. That's why they have shift boots. Uh, probably breathing in a lot of noxious gases I should not be but let's go see if the four-wheel drive works huh <laughs> yes Look at this crawl speed. Oh. You know what? I don't think I've ever felt four low with an NV3550. And combined with 355 gears. Oh my god. It's I'm on autopilot, just, just casually driving over these uh these sand ruts. Sir. Sir, can I ask you to stop the vehicle? Having too much fun, aren't you? Yeah, I'm gonna have to take over for you here. Thank you, sir. Good day. I think one of my favorite parts about the Jeep is you can just put it back in two-wheel drive, it right back home after doing all sorts of crazy shit but any faster than 20 miles an hour and the jeep vibrates like you're being summoned by the damn graybeards i traced this issue down to the rear drive shaft as with the shaft removed and using only front wheel drive there was absolutely no vibration whatsoever so I'm in front wheel drive mode and well first of all this feels really interesting it kind of it kind of has like torque torque in the steering while while you're on the gas i don't know it's it's unique but there's absolutely no vibration with just the front drive shaft in here so that's absolutely 100 percent the problem i initially thought the slip yoke was somehow too loose on the output shaft which doesn't make any sense but after getting a slip yoke from a junkyard and putting it on my drive shaft the problem persisted at this point, I was almost a whole day behind on my trip to the court trial. The XJ is not designed to drive, especially at highway speeds, with only a front drive shaft. The rear one will absolutely not work, 
and so I couldn't take it up north for an unknown, stupid problem that nobody's ever had. Bryant noted that, although this also wouldn't make any sense either, maybe my pinion angle wasn't right, and sure enough, after measuring the drive shaft angles with an app, my pinion is somehow at a steep 7 degrees. The stock should only be about 2 to 3 degrees. This would absolutely explain the drive shaft vibration, and I'll somehow have to fix my pinion angle, which again doesn't make any sense because there was never a problem with the two-wheel drive transmission. This is the exact same axle and the set of leaf springs from the Reclaimer, which also never had any issues, and I didn't change anything that would alter a pinion angle. So I don't know how the hell this is suddenly a problem. But aside from that, everything else works, and it's nice to finally be back in a real Jeep with real four-wheel drive. I felt like a sinner without it. So how will I get to my court trial? Should I buy this 1996 four-cylinder shitbox? Can I use a 1985 transfer case in a 2001? These are all questions nobody should bother asking because I've got a lot to figure out and you've got a lot more research to do. So check out the description for a metric boatload of information that'll probably keep you busy for a few days. I hope your four-wheel drive swap goes well, and if you run into any problems or unforeseen obstacles, especially on the older model years, leave a comment and let everyone know. My 2001 is going to be a little different than most every other model year out there, but I hope I was able to at least convey some tangible sense as to what this swap requires. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you when I drive my ass up north anyway, and at last put to rest the trial for the Reclaimer.